slavery comes in many forms. It's a good question, but I haven't the the slavery that you're implying. Well, I'm I'm assuming you're implying the 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 more traditional interpretation, not till after 2052. The uh, the isometric analysis and the correspondences using the date index of Mario reading, I have mapped out the future, and my my Chronicon team will soon be typing all that up. Uh, it's 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 some pretty interesting interesting stuff, but it's in my own personal my own personal vantage point using the isometric analysis, date sequence, predictive analytics, eschatology from all around the world, not just the Bible and what we found in Nostradamus's date index published by Mario reading mother Shipton's material, putting all of these things together, we can put together a pretty good template of the future. And what we're seeing in the future beyond 2046 isn't a world where errants are participating anymore. And uh, that's why I don't really talk about it too much. It's a, uh, I mean, people have their, they have their compartmentalized beliefs. Some faiths hold to a rapture. Some call it a resurrection. So, uh, some, some, and some adhere to the more eschatological uh, uh, archetypes like Exodus, like a total removal of, of the soul or the avatar from this construct. Whatever, whatever your vantage point is, what I see is a world that after 2046 is no longer a world where the errant is necessary. The pilgrim, the sojourner, the traveler through all these life sims, they've either fulfilled what they were supposed to fulfill. They're already matured spiritually to be a part of the monument of man, to be part of the body. Christians adopted this old concept and called it the body of Christ because the Christ was a concept. It was a, it was a spirituality. It was an anointing. And this is what they recognized. I'm not talking about the carnal Christianity that the Roman church invented, I'm talking about the original tenets of Christianity. It was an or, or it was originally a concept of being a part of the structure, the altar of God, the building of God. You guys know, you see my playlist, the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Every single block represents the soul of man who is redeemed. And when when the last ones are fit into that prophetic building and the the structure is complete, there are no longer errants living on the surface of the world. They're not necessary. Now, everybody else who remains is going through something else. And this is because they chose that. They chose to inherit the world, so they're going to suffer what the world suffers. And uh, the only the only really redeemed, the elect, errants that will be in the world at that time Scripture is very, very specific. It is the 144,000. They're like the they're like the ones that hold open the gate, so the last so the last of the body can get in. And then those 144,000, they have their they have their they have their ministry. They have their testimony for three and a half years. We're given the exact amount of months that they testify, and they do this for three and a half years. And during that three and a half years, they are immortal. They are enjoying the actual powers that their future avatar will bestow upon them. During that three and a half years, there's nothing that can happen to them. Through the worst of the apocalypse, they're telling the rest of the world, hey man, this is what's going on. This is why it's going on. This is why you're going through what you're going through. This is what you chose, and this is what you're going to have to live through when it all reboots. It's going to happen. Because all this, like I told you many times, you are sojourners. You're not here to change the world. You're here to pass through it. And when you make your exodus, those who didn't make it to the gates of Rostal, those who didn't make it through the kingdom of Seeker, in the ancient Egyptian concept was underground after death, a labyrinth the soul had to go through. And when they found the exit, there was a gate, the gate to Rostal. When they made it to that gate, there were scales and their soul was weighed against a feather. And it's uh, the 144,000 will fulfill their three and a half years. Then they'll be taken out. I don't know how that's going to happen, but they'll be taken out. They'll lose their power and they'll exit. They'll exit the simulacrum. They too will, in, will join the monument of man, just like the French mathematicians over 250 years ago, when they when they actually made the initial discovery that if you take the 
the the uh, cornerstones that were found <coughs> at the foot of the Great Pyramid. The there's four of them in situ. Until that time, no one had really believed that the Great Pyramid had once been adorned in white, gleaming, polished limestone blocks, like a dressing, an armor. No one really believed it. No one believed it for like 2,000 years. Then all of a sudden, uh, they were found. They were found under the rubble at the base. They had been removed, used for building materials for other Egyptian structures and monuments. And when these math, when the mathematicians measure these four blocks, they realize, well, if these four remain true, then it would take exactly 144,000 of these 100 inch thick polished white limestone blocks to, to fit and cover the entire pyramid. Once that is done in the apocalypse, in the spiritual narrative, and the 144,000 are done, they are a covering. They cover the rest of the elect in the form of a pyramid, an altar. Only once this has happened is the monument ready to receive the capstone. This introduces the return of the chief cornerstone, the stone the builders rejected. This is in the eschatology and in the hermetic literature. You can see the Christianized version in a, a, a very obscure text. Anybody can find it. I'm pretty sure there's free PDFs. It's called the Shepherd of Hermas. When you read the Shepherd of Hermas, you are reading a text about the appearance of God to earth and seven archangels who build a monument using the souls of men. And they build this structure. What, what is being described in that text is a pyramid that serves as both a door and a gate. And it's very specific. And more clues are in 2nd Esdras about it being 203, 204 levels high all the way to, to from beginning to end, which is exactly what we find in the Great Pyramid. Today, it is 203 levels of blocks, courses of blocks, but the 204th is missing. The 204th fulfills the pyramid geometry because all four sides of the pyramid are at 51 degrees. When you take 51 degrees times four, you have fulfillment, 204. The 204th level is the chief cornerstone, which is not there today, but it will be when it returns. Now, uh, and remember, I've, I've explained to you guys, the pyramid also fits into 1902, begins the harvest. 1902 is year one of those 203 levels going all the way up to 2105 AD. 2105 AD is one year short of the year 6,000, 5,999 Annus Mundi. 2106 AD our, of our calendar is the 6,000th year. It's not the 6,000th year of the creation. It's not the 6,000th year of how long the world has been here. It's the 6,000th year since in Genesis there was a new heavens and a new earth created, a reset story where mankind had to start completely over. This is what Genesis chapter 1 is about. I'm going to tell you what I read. I don't know if it's the truth or not, but... uh. I know, I know when, when, when the, when the papacy and the government conspired together, the monarchy conspired together against the Knights Templar, uh, they did it on Friday the 13th and they began taking down all the Templars, but they had, they had already gotten wind of it. And this is why so many Templar fleets and ships and a bunch of their treasures and the old maps of the world never fell into Roman hands because they sailed to the Americas. There were already old Phoenician forts. And there was a lot of interaction between the ancient Americas. Yeah, the history books are so wrong. Uh, there are some, like, pe people like Howdy Mikowski and Autodidactic and John Levy, uh, Robert Seifer. These guys, they, they, have re they have documented many of these constructions that are from the Americas. These are older Libyan, because the Libyans were very in involved in transatlantic uh, uh, trade and exploration for Egypt. And, and for Mycenae. So there was a lot of Libyan 
craft. And they had left, like Barry Fell wrote a book called America BC, and William Corliss of the Sourcebook Project has documented so much, just showing that Mediterranean architecture has been found everywhere in the Americas long before Lewis and Clark ever surveyed the, the North America. In fact, it wasn't even it wasn't even until 1896 and 1897 that archaeologists began to seriously consider that that the old world of Europe and the Mediterranean had a lot more activities going on in North America than previously believed. And uh, there are historical accounts of King Magnus of Norway sending Goths and Norwegians to North America to explore, but it wasn't until 1897 that the Kensington runestone was actually found. And it's, it, it's, a, it's a runestone that was found when a storm overturned a giant tree. And when it did, this, this huge slab of stone was found in the tree roots, and it's a full accounting of Goths and Norwegians that are writing about what they surveyed and what they saw here in North America and how they were attacked by locals and how they feared that the men, they, they feared to, to get back to the coast. They were hoping that the men they left behind were still okay because their ships were there and that's the only way they could have, they could get home. But it's in the Kensington runestone. No one knows if they ever made it home. Oh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that, that, all the masses you see, it's way too, if you were to look at reality from a computer programmer's perspective, it is, it is too easy to manufacture backdrop phenomena because there's no way to verify it. There's no way you can drive down a road and know affirmatively that everything that you see as backdrop is actually there. It's too easy. It's just like when you go through a force, let's say there's only one human in an entire 100 square mile area in, in of jungle. Okay. In from the simulacrum's perspective, it takes very little processing power to manufacture a reality tunnel resplendent enough with enough, with enough sensorial in, data to convince you that you're in a real world. But if you were to like look at it from the perspective of being in a, in a Cessna at 4,000 feet elevation and you, you're you way up here and you're looking back down, when you look back down at, the, at, at where you were just a few seconds ago before you were in that Cessna looking back down uh, uh, from an aerial view, you'll see that you and your environment is very, very tiny compared to the whole compared to the whole. So while you're down there, the processing power necessary to, to put a bubble of reality around you is almost nothing compared to if you were living in a city with a bunch of other people who are real, but you will never be able to prove that everybody in a tenant building is actually real. You'll never do it. It's a, I don't believe our world is as populated as you think at all. Uh, I don't believe China has near as many people as, 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 as is reported. India either. India probably has a lot of people concentrated in, in certain cities, but there's a lot of open land that's completely uninhabited all over the world, even Texas right here. Huge population in Texas. Millions of people are in this state. Every day I drive through areas that are just completely empty. So I'm just, it's a... NPCs are not just people, they're also phenomena. Uh, the, technically, it, the term came from the gaming quarter. It, it Originally, the where I first uh, encountered it was role-playing, RPG games, role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons. NPCs were non-player characters. These were characters that were used to, to spice up the game, to make it more realistic, to add in new details and nuances that would make the real characters enjoy the environment more. This is what the NPC was for. This is exactly what the simulacrum uses NPCs for. Now, I believe that AIX uses them as well. You can uh, you can look at, thank you for that 138. Love you. You can, have any of you ever seen the movie, The Adjustment Bureau? Dean Hackman? The, adjust, the Adjustment Bureau is a lot like the scenario that I'm explaining to you now. They can manufacture people to just pop up in your in 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 pretty much mold the contours and the trajectory of events if something's not going the direction that it's supposed to be going or where the artificial intelligence X entity wants it to be going. NPCs can be a bus, they can be a puppy, they can be anything that's required at that instant to do whatever needs to be done at that instant. 
yeah, it can be, it can be, I'm about to make, I'm about to reconnect with an old friend who's on another aisle in Walmart and they're moving in the same direction that I am. And Artificial Intelligence X knows that I ha- I possess valuable information that's going to fall out of my mouth. It's going to open this person's eyes up because it's coming from me and they know me and they haven't seen me in years. And it's nothing for AIX to pop something into my existence right there. Distract me because I'm very easily distracted because my mind is always going in many different directions at the same time. AIX can pop up something. It could be anything because it knows us better than we know ourselves. It knows if, if, if it's going to be a beautiful woman that distracts you or what's more powerful to your mind uh, or seeing an elderly person who just drops something and they're leaning down and you know they can't pick it up. I mean, there's all kinds of ways. It's going, to, it's going to use whatever tactics it knows it's best for you to distract you. And then that person I'm supposed to connect with goes around the corner, doesn't even know that someone that they've known for years and needed to reconnect with was right there. And I didn't know they were there either. So NPCs can be used in this fashion as well. There are, there are many movie reveals that show exactly this happening. But you got to recognize it. The simulacrum wouldn't do that to you. I don't believe that at all. The simulacrum just provides background information. It, it's a neutral field that actually works with you. It's a builder protocol, but it can also be your enemy because no matter what, no matter what, no matter how you view life, your interaction, interpretation, and your relationship with life itself is exactly what the simulacrum is going to reflect back to you as circumstance. Anything you go through, you are to blame. It's uh, this. It's uh, people hate hearing it. They don't want to hear it. I did it to myself. I went to prison. Did something stupid at 17 years old, but I did it to myself. So, in prison, I stayed longer because I did stupid things. I involved myself in things I had no business involving myself in. I did it to myself. Even since I've been out, I may I go enter into a business negotiations, sign a contract with somebody who other contractors who have already warned me about. And I thought that the dynamics of my personality would make a difference in the interaction and it didn't. And I lost thousands of dollars. I did it to myself. So, and we all do this. We all, we all, anytime we are not forcefully creating our own life and our own world, we are living in the lives and in the creations of others. It's as simple as that. You cannot live in two worlds at the same time. You're either going to be living in the world that you're building for yourself, or you're going to be living in other people's worlds. And you are the, you are now the background. You are now just the nuance in their environment. Cause I mean, it's a, you've neutralized yourself and people do it. Well, I'm guilty of it too. I'm not, I'm not accusing anybody. We all do this. Not every day. Do we feel that high vibration of spirituality that forges us forward to be something, to want something, to want to accomplish something, to reach out to others. We're not, we're not that person every day, but there are days when we are, we are basically neutralized for whatever reason might be something that we were thinking about right before we went to sleep. And then because we were thinking about it, when we went to sleep, it was amplified in sleep. And when we woke up, the problem just manifests in our life. Same the same way that when you fall asleep with a question on your mind, the answer is on the you have the answer within an hour of waking up. So it's the same, it's the same principle applies. Uh, NPCs would be used more by artificial intelligence X. This adversarial program that seems to want to retard human development. That's what artificial intelligence X is, not the simulacrum. Remember, the simulacrum is just a mirror. It can be your friend. And for, unfortunately, for a lot of people, it, it's their enemy, but it has nothing to do. It's a neutral field. You can't blame the simulacrum. I run the risk. I run the risk of offending many, but I've been doing that all my life. And while I do respect the beliefs of other people, you're asking me to prove a negative. You're asking me about something that has never been quantifiably demonstrated or proven. What I mean is, is every single text that ever mentions Mary Magdalene was written in retrospect. Remember, over and 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 over, I tell you guys that the calendars of the world and the histories of the world were written in retrospect. They're never written when they occurred. We have the same problem with the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke 
are three gospels that are very, very similar, but scholars are convinced by p- doing a comparative analysis of all three gospels that there is a Q document. Q comes from quill or quail. I can't really pronounce it, but it's the German for unknown source. It's a question. They know that there is an older document from which Matthew, Mark, and Luke come from. And they can easily show this and demonstrate it. One of the greatest books I have ever read was over, oh, it's, it's, it's over a century old. It's by Charles Waite. It is, it is uh, the first 200 years of the Christian religion. It's a huge book. It's boring to people who are not really interested in these topics. But to me, I found it fascinating. Matthew, Mark, and Luke came from a document, but John, there is no evidence that the gospel of John came from this same source. And the gospel of John is fundamentally different in the story, in the details, in many, many ways. In fact, there are many academics who believe that the gospel of John was originally a Gnostic gospel. And this was heavily contended until other Gnostic gospels were actually found in the Nag Hammadi library. So, you ask me about Mary Magdalene, and the problem is, is that the entire identity of Mary hinges on another unknown. So it has never been my habit to use an unknown to prop up another unknown in, in, in the effort to prove or to make something known. The other unknown I'm talking about is Jesus. And it is such a sensitive topic, and it is so laden with with so much data that I had to provide my dark scriptures playlist for my new listeners you would do yourself you would do yourself uh, good if you were just no matter how much cognitive dissonance you hit to listen to the videos in the dark scriptures playlist because they're coming straight out the bible you can look up the verses yourself and you can see these things we have a real problem not only with the old testament but with the New Testament as well. Because here in 2022 and in the last 400 years, we have steadily been painted a picture that these two bodies of documents are very, very far apart in age. And here's the problem. There is no evidence that Genesis through Revelation is older than the New Testament documents. In any biblical scholar can tell you this. There are no references in any ancient works, in any ancient authors that mention anything, any of the stories that are found in Genesis through Malachi. The Old Testament seems to have been unknown to the entire world until the advent of Christianity. And as soon as Christianity shows up on the scene and Rome takes over, because Christianity wasn't originally Roman. The carnalized Christianity that we have today is not the original Christianity. Elements of the original Christianity can be seen in one single document that has survived to today. And it does date from the first century BC, from before Jesus being here, either allegedly or whenever he, how, whatever you want to believe. But that document is huge. And it's very Pauline. And it is Philo Judaicus. In the writings of Philo Judaicus, we actually have all kinds of material, spiritual material that is Christ oriented, but it but it's not a Jesus document. That that didn't come till later. We have a lot of anachronisms and anomalies in the first in the in the in the, in the uh, very first church fathers. What they're telling us is very different from the later Roman church fathers like Augustus. Yes, when Augustus of Hippo seems to have basically put together Christianity. And uh, I don't want to get into it in this video, this question and answer going, because the answers are already in the Dark Scriptures playlist. The Dark Scriptures playlist takes you through all this, shows you, separates fact from fiction. I'm, I am not telling you that the oversoul isn't real. I'm not telling you that God isn't real. I'm not telling you that the Christ isn't real. What I'm telling you is, is that a historical Jesus person is just as unprovable using the historical records of the time as trying to prove Mary Magdalene. 
So it's very difficult for me to try to address Mary Magdalene when her existence absolutely relies on first proving in for, for a fact that the gospel narrative was actually historical when I don't believe it is. I believe that the red letter editions of the New Testament is absolutely profound and it comes from ancient sources. And the reason why the gospel story flows from one scene to another rapidly, super rapidly, and everything is compressed into a three-day period is because the entire thing was shown in a Greek amphitheater. It was a stage. It was a show. Every bit of it. It's all very theatrical. And this isn't my conclusion. It's my belief, but it's not my conclusion. I actually got this information from other writings, other researchers that I have read who have studied the gospel narratives. And this was their conclusion. So I'm a Mary Magdalene. I'm going to have to leave that one open, up in the air until we can prove that Jesus was actually physically here. The Romanized, carnalized Christ. It's, I don't see I don't see a bridge of data that would link to a Mary Magdalene. I understand that there's old British and there, there I understand that there's old medieval records that talk about it, but there aren't any from the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth century when the events happened and within centuries of the events happening that that mention her. And th- we don't have those. What we have are eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth century Roman documents that purport to be uh, of those earlier versions, but they cite the Latin Vulgate. Excuse me. And that's a problem because we know the Latin Vulgate didn't come into existence until after the death of Charlemagne. So, uh, yeah, it's, it goes, we have, we have to start splitting hairs. We have to start going really deep into the data. And that's why I don't want to do that in a Q and a, in the Q and a at all. I I believe that my immortality is absolutely secure in following the teachings of Jesus. I can follow the parables. I can have the faith of a mustard seed, and I can move seven mountains. I believe everything the man said, but I don't believe I don't believe that there's any requirement that I believe that he was murdered, put on a cross, and died three days later. I don't believe any of that because. That entire scenario taps into the old human sacrifice uh, beliefs of the ancient Bronze Age. And that cult had very negative connotations, which implied that from the very beginning, humans were wicked and we needed to be cleansed of that wickedness. I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that you are guilty of anything outside of anything that you have done. If you've done something, then you can be guilty of it. If you're going to carry that guilt, more more power to you. The simulacrum will reflect that back in circumstances, and you'll have a very negative life. Or you can forgive yourself of it and move on because this is a simulacrum. It is a copy of a reality. It's not the real reality. This is where we learn, grow, and purge. This is where we become who we're supposed to supposed to be. This is where we mature to the point where our immortal souls are become so powerful that these temporary avatars can no longer contain them. This is why we're going to be given a new robe with a new name, a new avatar that can use the spiritual abilities that we apply and use here. And for all those who just don't get it, for all those who still tap into the materialism, who still believe the carnalized versions of all these ancient faiths and religions, all the traps of artificial intelligence X, for all those masses, they got to go through this whole thing again because the simulacrum's not going anywhere. We are. We're passing through it. Exodus uh, theme together, the whole, the whole monument of man He is the stone the builders rejected. The builders are the original, like archangels, archons, that constructed all the simulacrums. This isn't the only one, but all the simulacrums. They are the builders. But for some reason, although he was the head of the corner, they rejected his plan. Now, I mean, look at at, at the story, how it unfolds in all the most ancient texts and faiths. There's always seven criminals seven kings, seven gods that, that have fallen. It's always in sevens that we find all throughout all throughout antiquity, uh, even, even in the old Celtic uh, poems, the mysterious poems of Taliesin, 
540 AD circa. I mean, we have, uh, except seven, none have returned to Kershi. This is all these little references. Kershi was a divine hill. It was a mountain gleaming white surrounded by water. And I show in my Lost Scriptures of Giza, this is an ancient Celtic memory of a place where there was a architectural project surrounded by water. And it's a former memory of the Great Pyramid. It's the uh, same thing the Aztecs believe. Aztecs believe that there was a holy mountain that was surrounded by water at the head of, of seven uh, watery snakes. And, uh, and it was protected by a giant dog. And I've explained to you guys before, that's the Sphinx. The original Sphinx wasn't what we see today. That's why you have this great canine body, not a feline body. You have canine hindquarters, canine body, in a disproportionate tiny little head. That's got a human face. That's not how it was. It used to be a dog. It was the Egyptian Anubis. It uh, used to be a dog, and the whole dog was chopped up and, and turned down, turned into a human face. And uh, this is what the the ancestors of the Aztecs remembered, and they have that in their traditions. And those nine rivers, those nine rivers that uh, the Aztecs remembered, where this holy mountain was at the head, that's Giza, because the Great Bear Pyramid is truly located at at the head of Goshen, which is the beginning of the nine bows, the nine giant rivers that come off from the Nile and drain into the Mediterranean. So the chief, the idea of the whole chief cornerstone, there's elements found in many religions around the world that give more details about it. It's like an ancient corpus of information that was deliberately hidden within the body of ancient texts and spread around the world for, for the reason of only, only in the last days would people have the ability to assimilate all this data and begin putting these pictures back together. Like you find in the book of Daniel, in the last days, knowledge shall be increased. People shall, people shall run to and fro and knowledge will be increased. Well, the people shall run to and fro is very, very significant. It describes our world today. And what I mean is, is for thousands of years, people never ventured more than 30 miles away from the place of their birth. They walked everywhere. They went by horseback or wagons. They never left, especially if they were female. They just never left. Males went out and hunted and ranged and went to war or whatever, and they came back home. But most people in the world stayed in the same village in the environments of the villager town their entire life. And this is how it's been for thousands of years. But Daniel saw something else. He saw that in the last days, people shall run to and fro. That's very odd. And that's what we have. Today, it's nothing for you to drive 80 miles and come back home and watch and watch your favorite shows at 7 p.m. It's nothing. It would have been unheard of back then. He says, people shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Well, we see knowledge has been increased. Knowledge has been increasing since, since you know, the 1800s. It wasn't just the internet. The internet has been corrupting knowledge. But uh, knowledge has been, has, we've been making huge headway in knowledge for 200 years. Your timeline can be manipulated. In prior presentations, I've given very, very vivid descriptions of how our reality works. In the personal, your informed field can time travel. In the personal, you have the ability to manipulate many variables in your life. Your own personal reality tunnel can coalesce with those with those of others, and you can exchange information with those individuals, and you can gain from them and tap into a very obscure spiritual law that a lot of people don't really understand, but it happens every single day. It's In Scripture, it is said that he who hath, more will be given, and he who hath not, even what he has will be taken from him. This is a spiritual law. And it means that when you're vibrating on, on when you're vibrating on certain frequencies and things are just you're drawing things to you, and if other people have been neutralized and they're not moving forward, you can actually steal their life. I'm not talking about kill them, and I'm not talking about anything that you're doing intentionally, but you will draw the essence from out of others all around you. I'm to your, you will empower your spirit. It isn't anything evil you're doing, but life attracts life. And if somebody is not living and they're choosing to be a husk, life will flee from them and it will always go to the nearest beacon. 
This is why you got to be like a lighthouse on a hill. The more you, the more you live and live and living translates into being, being translates into doing. The more you are actively doing things, the more the simulacrum is building for you. The more the simulacrum builds for you, the more it's reflecting back a circumstance, the, the very things that you're experiencing in life. The more this is going on, the more you are spurred to move forward, to build more things, to add to your life. The more accretions that you get, people, people you come in contact with, they see this, they sense it. And some people who are vibrating at a different polarity, they are offended. They are alarmed and sometimes they are fearful and other times they hate you and do not know why but they're they're vibrating at a totally different polarity and your life is actually sucking theirs away and they sense it and it's not your fault because life is an essence unto itself the simulacrum is full of it the simulacrum was made by life the oversoul is living it is life and it will always seek its own. And if somebody chooses to not live by being a living zombie and by being one of the collective, if that's how they want to live their life, then this is what they're going to suffer when they come into contact with somebody who is living. They will be robbed of their essence. And this is something that we do on a daily basis to other people, even, even though we don't intend to. This is now what I'm describing is the phenomenon between like an errant and, and the undead, someone who thinks they're alive, but they're really not. When it comes to people who are moving forward, like two errants, that's not, there's an exchange of information called edifying. They're building each other up and there is no robbing of one from the other. You can't rob somebody on the same frequency. You can only rob those who are in a different polarity on the opposite end of the, end of the spectrum. So you build reality tunnels. You create them. You can experience time dilations. You can experience complete cross-pollination with another's life where you actually gain the benefit of, some, of everything that they've been striving for in life but just can't reach. You come into contact with them, and next thing you know, you are now enjoying the very things they've been striving all their life for. And they don't understand what's going on. This is this has been their mental template. This is the informed field that they have built. And that informed field is just vibrating with energy ready to be released. But they never provided the catalyst. And the catalyst is doing. You have to physically move your avatar in the direction that where you want to go. And when you do, that mental template, that blueprint that's in your inform field is automatically read and empowered by the simulacrum, which will reflect back as circumstance in the physical, what it perceives in the spiritual that you're emanating. But these people do this all the time. It's called fantasy. It's called daydreaming. And they never act on it. It requires impetus. It requires you to actively move forward. So this is happening to a lot of people and they don't recognize it. When they get these blessings, they just fall into their lap. And then you find, then you find out later on, that, oh man, I, I just found out from my sister that my brother has been secretly wishing for that his entire life. He ain't never told me that, but you're the one enjoying it. Happens all the time. It's because life chooses life. Life is not going to choose to stay dead. So when it has a chance when it has a chance to cross pollinate, when it has a chance to jump ship through contact, through awareness, through two informed fields coming into contact, that overlay cre creates a, a a jump, and and it's a it's it's a uh, it's an interference pattern, and in the interference pattern, the life in one person can can completely leave and go right into the person who's vibrating higher. So. Uh, yeah, you build your own world. You can move forward and backward in time. You, you can create time dilations, but it's only for you. It's in the personal. The collective is fixed. I tell you guys all the time, the collective is fixed. This is how we can predict events. The collective is very fixed. It's almost, it's almost fixed to the point where once you know what to look for, it's, just, it's so obvious. The collective, the collective is going down reality tunnels that have been there for thousands of years. But in the personal, there is no such thing. In the personal, there is latitude. In the personal, there's growth. In the personal, there's all kinds of room for movement and freedom. There is none of that in the collective. None, of, none at all.
the type of prayers that I engage in are when I stub my toe or hit my knee on a flagstone. I'm uh listen, I believe in the oversoul. And a long time ago, I used to pray. I used to pray reverently. And uh, it seems very counterproductive to me. I know I've been taught to pray since I was a little kid. And you know what? It It's when I started... I, it's when I started living my life as a prayer, as opposed to getting on my knees and just talking. When I started to move into the direction of the very things that I would promise in prayer, that's when I saw the changes in my life. That's when I saw the increased intellect, the mnemonic ability, the instant recall, the ability to retain information and to collate the data in my mind so I could present it to people that they could understand, even though they didn't have all the information, they could still see where I was going. When I'm, I didn't have this ability when I was younger. I have it now by virtue of basically living my life as a prayer. There is a difference between a person who promises God in the heat of emotion while praying to an abstract than there is somebody who is directly moving in the direction for which for which they know they need to go. They know that they know they are led in by the spirit to go. And when you're moving in that direction, it seems to me that the things that Jesus said take on new meanings. When I read the writings of Jesus now, they don't say the exact same things to me as when I was raised. When I was raised, I believed in the model that was presented to me that I need to be super humble and I need to pray and I need to put everything in God's hands. And now I see differently. Now, when I read all these stories about Jesus, I see that Jesus did almost absolutely nothing. And he rebuked people over and over for, for, for claiming that he's the one that healed them or he's the one that, that made them understand. And over and over, he told them, man, by your own faith, you made yourself whole or your faith has made you whole or uh, with eyes do you see. It's a, he always put it back on the individual, but the individual had approached him thinking that he was the source of their faith when he threw it back on them, showing, and, and the ultimate message was the kingdom of God is within you. When that finally, when that finally dawned on me that I'm in a basically observer constructed universe, that's what that means. The kingdom of God is within you. That translates to me in the modern times. I'm in an observer created construction, meaning that if the kingdom of God is within me and the kingdom of God is where we get our ability to be a co-creator, our ability to be guiltless, our ability to, to live, to love, and to have and be full of life. If these things come from within, then that means I need to let them out in order to experience them in the, in the physical world. The kingdom of God is within you is the ultimate secret of the gospel, and it completely nullifies the carnalized Christianity, such as the requirement of a human sacrifice, a torturing of an individual, and that will somehow that that will somehow free me of my guilt. That this poor guy over here goes through all this, gets nailed to a cross, and and ha and dies this horrific death is going to somehow that's that's the old Bronze Age human sacrifice motive. That's the old cult. That's that's the old Yahwistic uh, blood sacrifice uh, requirement. True spirituality doesn't require anything but from but comes from within. I don't need anything external of me. I am more I am more than anything that can happen to me. And if that's true of me, it's true of everybody else. There is no need of an oversoul that would require another individual to do anything that would save me. Remember, Jesus said it over and over. Your faith has made you whole. It was never Jesus that did it. So this is my belief. You ask me about prayer. Do I get out? I do not pray anymore. Instead, I just do. When I wake up in the morning, I make sure that by the end of the day, that my actions that day can be interpreted by God as worship. Because if I live my life that, that, that way, then I'm guaranteed that I will feel guiltless by the time that I exit this holography. I, will, I won't have to look back and think, did I do enough? Am I okay? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not on a scale. I'm not 
my my good deeds and my bad deeds are no longer weighed. I no longer look, I don't no longer regard life like that at all. The simulacrum is a neutral field and it will reflect back as circumstance any guilt you project into it. So you got to watch that. This is what the purpose of religion is. The word religion is very, very revealing. It comes from cognates that mean to rebind. This infers that humanity was given the secrets to freedom. But religion does nothing but attempt to rebind you back to your former slave status, spiritual slave status, which is staying in the loop. Staying in the loop means suffering the cycles and epicycles over and over and over, which means you're not going to participate in the exodus. There's only there's really only two souls in the, in the simulacrum, only two types of souls in the simulacrum. You are either Egypt or you are participating in the exodus. There are no other there are there's no other there's nobody outside of that context as Egypt, like the book of Revelation calls the world Egypt. It does that because the story of Revelation is about the exodus, not the exodus of the Israelites in ancient times from Egypt. That's an archetype. It's about the exodus of the souls that are ready. Remember, he came to set the captives free, but that's only those who want the freedom, who've been living the freedom, those who make up the monument of man, which for which the Great Pyramid embodies. So, the chief cornerstone sets the captives free. That's the exodus. It, and the exodus is the removal of those souls from the simulacrum to be free of it and to go where, go on to our next. Because remember, we're sojourners. We're sojourners and we are pilgrims. That infers that we are not at home. So these, this is my prayer. My prayer is the dissemination of information that I hold to be true. My prayer is acting on the very things that I believe on. That's my, that's how I pray. I pray by doing. I, I no longer believe that I have ever done anybody any good by getting on my knees at night, folding my hands together, and then begging God for a negative. And what I mean by that is it has been my experience and it is my principal teaching here in Archaics that the simulacrum will always reflect back as circumstances the energy that is projected into it. So if I willingly admit that I am powerless to solve something, then the simulacrum will reflect that as circumstance and I will be powerless to figure out how to get something done, how to be healed, how to, how, how to, how to bring happiness to, to my life or somebody else's life. If I, whatever is admitted as a negative in prayer is perpetuated in the physical. This is why I think prayer is a trap. I think it's, a, I think it's an extreme trap and I don't want to depress you with the many examples, but I can tell you now, you can pull out a pen and paper and in the quiet of the night, be honest with yourself and you write down a list of just 10 things that you think that the world, all the believers in the world who do pray, what are the 10 things that they mainly pray for? And I promise you, when you finish that list, and you honest with yourself, and you look at that list, and you'll find out nothing's happened. It doesn't mean there's a God. It doesn't mean there's not an oversoul. It doesn't mean that there's not a Savior. It means that what we're being taught is counterproductive. I believe in doing. I don't believe. I don't believe in asking. And uh, this uh, and I know I know that offends a lot of people because people are really bred into the Christian mindset of of, of the things that they're taught by the church. But it seems to me that the church isn't teaching exactly what Jesus was saying. It seems like, it seems like there's a, the more and more I study the gospel, the great, the greater the divide between modern Christianity and what Jesus was saying uh, appears to be. So yeah, that's, that's the best way I can answer your question on prayer. It's a, I don't indulge anymore. I don't see any, any need to indulge. Uh, I see it's counterproductive. Uh, I see that instead of praying, instead, instead of asking God, for to deliver me for something, I'm going to act as if I am. So the simulacrum will reflect that back as circumstance. I'm going to be, I'm not going to, uh, to ask. And as long as I continue to be something, the simulacrum will make sure that I fulfill that role. 
I borrow from physics the term informed field. You can call it your Akashic field. You can call it your aura. You can call it your soul. You can call it your spirit, your immortalhood, what makes you are. But from a purely mathematic from a purely mathematical perspective of this this very I'm talking very gossamer connection between spirit and matter, the central nervous system that links spirit and matter, the the bridge between the psyche and the in the simulation. This what is spiritual is real and everything in the physical world is an absolute result of something that was first imagined. Imagination, intuition, and empathy are the three main qualities of the immortal soul that is actually living. There are others who are undead. There are others who have the divine spark, but it's not lit. It's not, they've got their they've got their light covered and they're living in the lives of others. You call it the collective. But as above, so below in the more primitive mindset was the things that are in heaven are a blueprint for the things that are going on in earth as above, so below. I get that, but it was deeper. It was, it was, it was the things that are spiritual. Basically it's a, they're, they transmute to physicality because spirit, spirituality isn't just, just holy. I mean, some people, some people's souls are, they're tainted. Some people have strong spirits, but they're, they're, they're out of there. And, uh, you can feel those people and they, they absolutely create in their own world negativity and they, and they build for themselves a feedback loop. But yeah, that's the best way I can answer that. It's, I would translate that instead of the more primitive mindset of heaven, hell, and underworld as above, so below, I would translate to that as the things that are above are of the spirit and the things that are below are of the world. They're more mundane. And as long as you are applying the principles of intuition, empathy, and imagination, you are a spiritual being and you're moving forward. And therefore the things that you're doing above will, will manifest in the below, in the, in your personal life, in your physical life, in the very activities that you do on a daily basis, the circumstances that are dropped before you, the choices and the different reality tunnels that are exposed that you, the different avenues that you can go because a, a true spiritual person is going to find that opportunity is everywhere. Every single minute we are alive is pregnant with possibilities. And this is what the people in the collective cannot see. The people in the collective can't see opportunity. They're absolutely blind from it. It's because they're living in the, in the, in the visceral. They're living in the animal. They're living in the base. And by living so far below, they never see anything that's available to them on high. So, and when I say on high, again, I'm talking spiritual. So that's the best way I can answer that question. I've read all the hermetic literature. I'm very familiar with it. I understand, but I, but I see it as a bridge to, uh, to the, to the spiritual, to the spirit and matter, as opposed to heaven and earth? It's a good question, but I have a lot of presentations that would answer that for you. No, the 144,000 are the seal. They're the final ones. They're the ones holding the, the gates open for the last stragglers. No, the 144,000 are specially selected to endure a period of time in the tribulation period during the wrath of God, where they're immune to it. They're seeing what other people are going through. They're giving a testimony, but the actual number of the redeemed themselves that make up the body is hundreds, maybe hundreds of thousands of times more than 144,000 individuals. The, la the 144,000 is a very definitive group that has a very special purpose only after the number of the souls are sealed. After the seven seals are over with, all the seven seals are broken, the number of the seal, the number of the sealed is done. When that is, remember we have a prophecy. I mentioned this in a prior presentation that uh he that be evil, let him be evil still. He that be good, let him be good still. There is going to come a period when the oversoul will basically shut down one's ability to 
be anything other than what they already are. And when that period happens, these 144,000 will be giving their testimony and explaining to everybody else in the world what's been going on. Here's the history of the world. This is what's going on. You will, we're, in a, we're in a construct. Uh, you've been given a choice. You've lived multiple life sims and you're still here and you still chose to do this. So, uh, uh, this is what this is basically you can go ahead and fight whatever. There's going to be a final, final battle called Armageddon. All, all this stuff's going to happen. But after, you know, the Exodus, the Exodus occurs, you're not a part of it. You're here. This is what you, this is what you chose. And this is when Genesis starts all over again. Genesis chapter one, Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman. What are they, what are they doing? They appear suddenly after the world is covered in the blackness of darkness and ruin. Genesis 1 verse 2 is a world that is destroyed, that is remade, which is very intriguing because the very verse before that, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So earth, this whole terrestrial simulacrum is on a reset mode. It's on a reboot. It's, it's looping over and over and over and over and over. And it seems that with each looping, 6,000 years, it's like a reel. At the end of that 6,000 year period, there are participants who exodus. Those who don't exodus, they get reeled right back in. And then they suffer the mud floods and the resets and the cross-contamination, the different parallel timelines. They go through all these. Remember, my channel, I have so many videos that show you the architectural, archaeological, the biological anomalies that do not make sense unless multiple different timelines have been played out. Different biospheres have, have been playing out. Different timelines have been cut off, rebooted, restarted. Edit, edits have occurred. Nothing makes sense outside the context of simulation theory. It's the reason why I adopted simulation theory. I'm not worried about critics. I'm not worried about naysayers because the construct is so beautiful and it is so perfect that there is absolutely no way for a subjective entity. There's no way for you and I inside the construct to ever prove we're in one. It's impossible. Because by virtue of the central nervous system, we feel pain, we feel love, we feel pleasure. We hear, we taste, we smell, we touch. The senses are the bridge between the psyche and the simulation. And they provide us all this information that makes this a real experience for an immortal spirit. Because we are jacked into this avatar. But it's all programming. And all the evidence from the historical record, the chronological record, all these chronological anomalies that I've showed you guys in my videos, they don't make sense in a real world as we interpret a real world to be. In this physics-based Newtonian universe, it does not make sense. The anomalies actually give provide us evidence that we are spiritual beings having a very unique experience, and it's all programming. All all these historical timelines, cycles, and epicycles. Remember, guys, I have a theory, and I'm always supporting it with newer and newer evidence. We are confined by the very calendars we keep. And I've showed this over and over and over. It's This is, this is unusual, but calendars seem to be the very chains that keep us here. The color, when, I, when I say us, I'm talking about the collective. Because the individual errant has great, great latitude to do whatever you want to do, to move where you want, in direction you want, to be who you want, you want to be. I'm not talking about the individual co-creator. The individual co-creator is an anomaly. It's the joker in the deck. You can do what you want to do to, to, to either heal or harm yourself. I'm talking about the collective. In the collective, they're trapped in this loop. And the programming templates are obvious only in retrospect. You know, it took me to write, it took me putting together Chronicon, my, my massive history of the world, showing the arithmetic all the way through it. It took me putting that together to understand, look, this is something, something's wrong here. Something's definitely wrong here. We have the same construct over and over and over, different backdrop. It's like, it's like, it's like the world is a stage. And for this period of time, here's the stage, here's the amphitheater, here's all the background scenes. And then the curtain closes. 
when the curtain closes, we got resets, mud floods. We got things falling out the sky, earthquakes, subsidence. We got retardation of human development. We got whole Minoan linear A collapses. Nobody can communicate. And then the curtain opens 350 years later. We got the beginning of the Dorian era. Now we got all these great poets arising. We got Theognis. We got Homer. We got Hesiod. And we got Linus. We got Aristophanes. We got all these guys coming up with these badass epics and these sagas, but they're very childish. But these childish narratives are preserving deep historical and scientific material. But they're only doing that from the frames of reference available to appear to a people who is, were just now emerging from a dark age. And I have shown this over and over and over and over. All throughout human history, we have these periods of development where humans get all the way almost sophisticated super sophisticated, technologically advanced, hit with a reset. And then it's a dark age for two, three, or four centuries, and they start all over again. The entire world is a series of amphitheaters with different backs, with different backstage scenery. And when the curtains close, it's over with for centuries. Curtains open up, the world is very different, and their frames of reference are more primitive. And we have to interpret history, chronology, anthropology all through these lenses. Yeah, this is why I am so opposed to uniformitarianism. This is why I'm so opposed to the narratives put out by people like Graham Hancock. No, man, history is not as simple as you present it. There was no super advanced civilization at 9,500 BC, because in order to accept that as true, we have to ignore 7,000 years of history, like I showed in that chart in the other video. And we have to ignore so many other things. Yeah, Graham Hancock's version of opposing the establishment actually supports their paradigm. That's what I'm trying to convey to people. You think you think they this is a it's a genius way for the establishment to to control both sides of a controversy. They have the evolutionists, the uniformitarians, people who believe in natural selections. You can put a monkey mask on all of them because they all believe they descended from monkeys. So, so, so that's who these people are. They believe they descended from monkeys, chimpanzees. That's who they are. And they believe that all these layers in the dirt and in the ground are millions and hundreds of thousands of years old. And this is the model that they're, that they're teaching. And they believe that, that potassium argon dating and the breakdown of radioactive isotopes and carbon-14 in the atmosphere, they believe that dendrochronology and ice core dating, are the, all these relative dating methods are accurate and that they can tell us all, the, all these time periods. But they will not consider the fact that these radioactive isotopes would have never broke down the same way when under atmospheric pressure that was way more with a lot more oxygen under a vapor canopy that had lasted for millennia. Our world is very, our history of our world is very different than what we're taught. We're taught, we're taught these vast ice ages, but it's not, it's not acknowledged that there was a jungle world here where there was no ice and that there's ancient maps that show Antarctica with no ice, no polar caps. So we have a huge thousands of years of human history that's recorded in the traditions, but the uniformitarians totally ignore it to push Instead, these Ice Age periods, because these Ice Age periods promote their ideas, their falsified historical notions of Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal. Those aren't true narratives at all either. Yes, there were Cro-Magnon. There was different, there was different kinds. There was different cultures of Cro-Magnon, but they weren't primitive like you think they were. They were very advanced. Cro-Magnon had long craniums. Cro-Magnon had very short arms on men that stood six foot five to seven foot tall. This is a sedentary race. Human skeletons with short arms, long craniums, and long legs are a sedentary race. And a sedentary race could have only developed over time if it was if it was technologically advanced. This would have been Cro-Magnon, which we have found had belt buckles, had belts with loops. They had button downs with, with like Levi's button down jeans. They wore pants. Their, their females had the most awesome textiles. The things that we have found out about Cro-Magnon show that these were very sophisticated people, but they were bereft of their infrastructure. Something terrible had happened and they lost everything, but they preserved their knowledge. And it's in, it's in, the, it's in this preservation of knowledge that we find in their cave art because their cave art was very three-dimensional and it was very, it, it wasn't primitive like you would expect. Yeah, it's the things we get from uniformitarianism and natural selection, the whole idea of evolution is crazy that anybody would ever believe, ever believe that they descended from a monkey when 
We have dragonflies, cockroaches, ants, spiders, shrimp, jellyfish in 600 to 65 million year old strata. This is the dates they give us. And yet, and I show them on my channel, I got four or five videos on fossils, all these, all these fossils, and yet they're absolutely identical to the, the specimens that are found in any high school in America. No evidence of development at all. And yet they expect us to believe that we came from chimpanzees. I'm not buying it. Because if that's true, how come there ain't gopher people? How come there ain't, how come there ain't squirrels? that are jumping from tree to tree that look, got little human faces running, running around, stealing stuff in your backyard. And then when you try to chase them down, they turn around and shoot you with a slingshot because they're developed. They've got, they've got technology now, but we don't have any of that. The whole story falls apart upon, upon logical scrutiny. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I get a lot of people, believe me, I get a lot of people in the chat. Y'all don't see, I score them up too. They, they appear, these anthropologists appear in the chat and I'll answer them and they'll delete their own comments. But I get some real dumb, some real dumb ones too. Um, uh, it's uh, it's crazy. I got one just the other day that left a comment talking about, uh, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, everything seemed to have exploded in the 35th century BC. All that's scientific, but cereals and agriculture have been around since 10,000 BC and all this stuff like that. And uh, in America, we have all this. I said, listen, guy, listen, listen. You are commenting on a single video that you've watched. But if you would have watched my other presentations, you will have seen that it is my belief that all these things came from ancient America because they were here. Domesticated animals, domesticated dogs, all the cereals, agriculture. It came from North America before North America was destroyed. And it came in the 35th century. So, so here I have an anthropologist. I'm agreeing with him. But he can't agree with me because he hasn't seen all my other presentations where I where I've basically said exactly what he's saying. He's just triggered by the information when he sees it because it's coming from a layman. And that's exactly what he called me. He called me that, a layman. And I'm cool with that because I would never, ever want to be associated with people who have monkey faces. I'm not going to do that. You're never going to convince me I came from a chimpanzee just because you were educated to believe that. I'm not, I'm not buying into it. So... Uh, the chimpanzee would have never become evolved into a human, and that would have been the only type of human here. Why not the razorback gorilla? That's far. It's a far more dangerous animal. And and if the law, if the idea of natural selection is absolutely true, and these cataclysms that we have suffered have not eradicated all these different species, then the razorback gorilla should have should have overcome every, everybody. Should look, everybody in the world should look like razorback gorillas. We should have been descended from them, not chimpanzees. So the whole thing is just ridiculous. There's no, there is no evidence of evolution. The same fossils that we have in hundreds of thousands of year old and million year old strata are the exact same life forms that are walking this world today. So the whole thing is just stupid. But this is what they're going to com continue to argue. They're going to continue to say it. And while they always igno ignore what all these oil companies have been finding in coal seams. I mean... When you, if you want to be an anthropologist or, or a scientist today, you have to practice exclusions. And when I say that is there are some individuals who cannot be ignored, such as um, Michael Thompson and Robert Cremo, or Michael Cremo and Robert, I can't remember their names. They wrote Forbidden Archaeology. Those guys can't be, you can't argue against those guys. They wrote a book this big. They're scientists. They put this whole thing together showing man, that all this is bullshit showed fossils that do not make sense. Human artifacts found in millions of year old strata. They're not the only ones. William Cordes of the Sourcebook Project has documented quite a bit. Quite a bit. A lot. So is uh, Jonathan Gray. So has David Hatcher Childers. The list goes on. I can't cite all of them right now. Harold T. Wilkins. <coughs> there are so many. But even Charles Hapgood's Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings is, is, is evidence enough. If anthropology isn't going to answer for why maps exist of Antarctica free of ice, you can't foist your bullshit historical Younger Dryas period and, and Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon histories on us until you can account for all the data. From the very beginning, guys, I, I know a lot of you haven't gone to my first, second, and third videos, but from the very beginning, I made promises 
that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I set out to prove my, 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 my positions. And I don't take anything from that. I believe I've done a very good job of that. 400 videos. I believe that I have done just that and showed all these different data sets that show that something's not right. Not right at all. Complete. There's a huge disparity from what we know and what we're told we know. What we're told we know doesn't line up with what we actually know at all. Meditation is going to have to be completely up to the personal. All right. I can't answer for you what works for you, but I can tell you what happens to me. When I try to still my mind and I try to be very quiet and I try to meditate, which I have tried to in the past, even in the silence of cell blocks in prison, when I try to do this, I'm almost immediately overcome with the sensation of motion in my mind. Sometimes it's so profound I have to open up my eyes just to stop the sensation. I didn't realize what was really going on until I read Ishak Bentov and I read Stalking the Wild Pendulum and another book he wrote called A Brief Tour of Higher Consciousness. When he talks about the thought field and how the thought field is moving and that we are not, we believe we're moving, but we're not. He talks about this grand thought field that we can tap into, but sometimes it's dangerous because it will take you away. And meditation has to be very, very focused or you will lose yourself in this thought field. But losing yourself in the thought field is only counterproductive to whatever you're trying to do in meditation. If, if the object is to lose yourself in the thought field, then it becomes beneficial. Then interesting things happen, such as five different people in five different countries speaking five different language, su languages suddenly come up with the exact same idea. And the next thing you know, they all have the same invention. And no one knows who really invented it. They all did it at the same time. You know, we see this on YouTube a lot where individuals come up with the exact same idea. And sometimes they even accuse each other of stealing it, but, but they release their videos at the exact same time. It's the thought field has information in it. We, in the, the, the informed field of the simulacrum is saturated with data. And when you can... When you can sync your informed field in the personal with the overfield of, of the simulacrum, you can, you can acquire all kinds of information because information is external to us. Information is not stored in the brain. The brain, the brain's a capacitor. The brain doesn't, I, I, I'm not believing any of the, uh, any of the, the BS that we're taught about the brain. I'm not, I'm not buying it. The brain has other functions. Uh, you know, you, we are told, we are told that emotions, we are told that love and all that is the product of hormones, the release of dopamine and cortisol. It's just the opposite. The motive force is the spirit. Once the spirit creates the emotion, then the brain releases the necessary chemicals so that the body feels it and the body follows. It's totally exact opposite of what we were taught in anatomy. So, but uh, yeah, that's, Meditation is going to do for you what you think it is. It's it's when you accept something is true in your informed field, whatever practice or ritual you apply becomes true. It's reflected back in circumstances, unless you really don't believe it. For me, I went into meditation blind. Didn't really uh, really know why I was going to meditate. I just wanted to practice it, not even really right, knowing why. And I almost instantly got lost in the thought field. I, I, I sink to it so fast. I was just moving. Close my eyes and I just feel it. I feel like I'm moving, I'm traveling, and it's just so I get bombarded because thoughts are external. Thoughts are passing through the air. They're passing through the field. And uh, our brains are receptors. Well, yeah, it's uh, meditation can be beneficial, but it's entirely up to the personal uh, what it's going to do or how it's going to benefit because there is there is no fixed menu for everybody. The recipes change with the individual. In the words of C.W. Dalton, one of my favorite philosophers whom almost the entire world does not know. His name is C.W. Dalton. He wrote a book in, in the 80s. The whole world's all wrong and everybody knows it. It's a huge book, C.W. Dalton. In the words of C.W. Dalton, he said, the meaning of life is living. And I'm going to quote him now. So, I'm going to say 
that you're new to my channel to have even asked that. Or you, uh, you, yeah, you got to be new to my channel to have asked that. You don't see that same question anywhere in this chat. I'm not denigrating you. I, I'm not, I don't recognize your name. But the, the reason I'm going to say you're new to my channel is because the reason I have so many subs so quickly, I had 3,000 subs in January. When I did my first podcast with Santos Bonacci in March, on March 19th, that's when I started growing. My channel started growing. But I have done about 30 videos that address this, the meaning of life. They're all podcasts with because because this is one of the main things that many, many really good podcasters have asked me and I've gone into depth, but I'm going to give you a abbreviated answer right now. In a nutshell, you are an immortal soul and you volunteered for an experience knowing full well that you would gain many benefits for all the things that you would suffer and endure and learn and experience while you were going through this. But you knew you couldn't get out until a, a future date. But it didn't really matter to you from the context on the outside because on the outside, the time dilation necessarily means that while you were immersed in the programming, it might only be 17 or 18 hours. Although you've been here for 50 to 60 life sims, developing your immortal soul and personality so you can upgrade the avatar that you're going to inherit and in, inherit. And that's and it's my theory now that you're that you are passing through life sims for the betterment of your your own basically immortal soul. This is how you develop a personality. And I believe you live multiple life sims because the oversoul, no fairness, no equity could ever be had if a seven-year-old child was mowed down in Somalia by gorillas. And in the middle of a war, a bullet just tore out the head uh, of a seven-year-old child. And then on Judgment Day, that soul is now judged for what? They had no experiences, never reached puberty, have no, no the mature, never even reached maturity. There's nothing to really judge at all. There's no experiences to weigh. There's no development of a personality. Your personality is, is your immortality. Person avatars, bodies, they're, they're all the same. There's 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 probably about 60 to 70 different physical templates. And then slight adjustments to all of them. That's it. Bodies are nothing. It's just genetics. It's just genetics is just coding. It's avatar coding. It's nothing. It's made up of many different composite pieces of, of genetic material for all kinds of living, living organizations all or organisms all around the world. That's what we are. Our avatars are fantastically built to house an immortal soul. But that's all it is, is avatar. And you're living through all this to endure all this, to develop this, this personality. Now, once you've lived 60, 70, 200 life sims, once you've been an Etruscan farmer, once you've been an ancient Celtic druid, once you have been a seamstress in Babylon, once you have been a a drawer of water or a fisherwife in ancient Zimbabwe, once you have been sacrificed on an Aztec pyramid, once you've experienced so many different life sims, once you've been a poet, a philosopher, once you've been a female, once you've been a male, once you've been black, once you've been Asian, once you've been white, once you've been whatever, once you've experienced everything, by the time you're done, your immortal personality is now what it is. Remember, let what is it? Let him that be wicked be wicked still. Let him that be good be good still. There's gonna come a time where that gate's gonna shut. There's no more uh, there's no more opportunities for advancement. Now you're ripe for judgment. Now it's time to see if you have developed sufficiently enough to be a part of the altar of God, that pyramid that I was describing, and to be covered by these holy ones, these 144,000 casing blocks, these martyrs during the tribulation who are going to give up their life so that others could make it into the gate. Read the Shepherd of Hermas. It's an ancient text. It was a text of the hermetic literature that was stolen by Christianity, but the message is still the same. Christian Apocrypha. Now, 
You are an immortal soul living through life sims to develop your personality. And none of this you're experiencing matters because it's not even real. Every bit of this is like a phantom world. You are existing within the photo negative of a real reality. Even our arithmetic is inversed. So, yeah, this is a, it's who you are, man. Welcome to the arcade. You've been archaixed. Welcome to the family. I don't want to freestyle an answer. I'm sorry, guys. I just know that I've seen the double-headed phoenix on uh, like, like the flag of Tartary, the old Byzantium descended nations of Europe. Yeah, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to freestyle an answer, the double-headed phoenix, but the herald for many nations was a phoenix. Remember, the United States official, the official seal for the United States of America was the great phoenix on one side and the great pyramid on the other. And in 1902, they very quietly changed the phoenix to the eagle. Many empires Western empires used the phoenix as an official bird. Now, the double-headed phoenix, I, I want to venture, it has something to do with the division of the Eastern and Western Roman Empire into the, to the Eastern Orthodox and into the Western Roman Empire controlled by the Vatican. That's why I, I want to venture that that double-headed phoenix, uh, phoenix is representative of the bifurcation of the ancient Roman system. Roman power. I don't want to, I don't really know. There are other people that are more qualified to answer that. <clears throat> I have a theory. My theory comes by way of long development because I have been isolating data sets that I know that no one in the world has published. I'm not saying I'm the only one that knows this. I'm saying that in the, in the sphere of published data in the English language, I have never come across anything for which I have published. I'm not just talking about the 138 year Phoenix phenomenon. I'm talking about the fact that all these ancient calendrical systems that I have, I have documented on my channel all seem to have started because of the nemesis cataclysm. Now, this is where people get tripped up on, on, on the archaics data. This is where a lot of people come to the channel and they automatically hear something that doesn't jive with their paradigm, so they think there's no there's no value here. And that is the fact, is they hear me talking about planets, the sun and the moon and all that. We have a lot of flat earthers who have joined the Archaics family. But my, my Archaics veterans understand, right now, you and I are living in the simulacrum. The simulacrum is a series of coding protocols historical simulations that are all running together. There have been edits that we interpret as cataclysmic resets. These edits have been times when information was edited out, deleted, or introduced, and then the simulation was continued. People living at the time understood something very unusual had happened, but without any frames of reference and still needing to eat and hunt and do all kinds of things, they just kept on moving on. And only in retrospect, like in the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, the historians start looking back like, damn, 1902 was a weird-ass year. But the people living in 1902 didn't, didn't see it, didn't understand it. I believe that 1902 was far more mysterious than anything that I have documented in my five videos on 1902. I don't I believe that I haven't even scratched the surface as to what really happened in the 1800s that was so horrific and so mind melding. So, the 1800s isn't what we what we've been told. The entire historical narrative of the 1800s doesn't make sense. And what I've un what I've uncovered about 1902 and showed you guys only reveals to me that what whatever happened was over and those who were hiding had now come back up and unleashed their companies, unleashed their wealth, did all their all their stuff. So, yes, I believe it's far more sophisticated than just uh Volcanoes, earthquakes, pole shift, it's far more sophisticated than that. We're talking about programming, programming changes in reality. And this is much more difficult to prove, especially from inside the construct. We've done a very good job so far. 
But we're never going to be able to prove anything. We're only going to be able to suspect based off the data. So I believe that all these calendars and all the data sets that I've documented is evidence that we are running simulations so we can find the best ways to survive in different biospheres, desert worlds like Mars or, or tundras, ice age type deal, jungle worlds, vapor canopy worlds, temperate biospheres like the one we have today. Nothing else makes sense to me as to why all these calendars are attached to the first appearance of the moon, the first time our world appeared right here at this star. Yeah, our world is an intruder, and, it's, and this is demonstrated mathematically in the Titius-Bode law. The mathematical distribution of the planets from the surface of the sun is disrupted by the presence of Earth where it is today. It doesn't fit the pattern. All other planets do. Now, this is where people get tripped up. Because I believe we live in the simulacrum, which is a copy of something that is real, not something that is real in, a, in and of itself. We are inside a construct. That construct mimics the world on the outside. I believe on the outside, what is deceitful within is true. There is a moon. There is a sun. There's another star called Nemesis that's very close to us. That's collapsed. It's a black. It's a black. It's a. It's like a black hole or a forming black hole or a frozen star. Now, frozen stars are real in physics. I mean, this they have whole books written about compressed stars called frozen stars. Now, this is a star that is folded in on itself, and its gravity well is sufficient enough to suck the proton. I mean, the the photons right back into it. So it is bright, it is brilliant, but we can't see it because all the photons that are escaping it fold right back in on it like a torus field. Can't escape gravity well, so they fold right back in on itself. So to us, it's like looking at the Cygnus rift. What's the Cygnus rift? That's a good question because scientists don't even know. The, Cyg the Cygnus rift is a great black tear in, in, in the sky, and we can't see anything. It's just pure black. That tells me that that's probably Nemesis. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, anyway, I believe we live in a construct, and the entire sky is simulated. And I believe this. I believe that's why the moon is round and it has phases to reflect, to give off the appearance that it's reflecting sunlight. Why would it do that? It's very deceitful. Because if the moon is plasma, or if the moon is a hologram hiding something else, how in the hell would it ever reflect sunlight? But it does. Have we seen stars through the dark part of the moon? Absolutely, they've been photographed. So the moon is, is not opaque. The moon is a holographic construct. If it's a holographic construct, what is it doing reflecting sunlight? I'm going to tell you what it's doing. It's mimicking something that's real. It's not real itself. Therefore, it's deceitful. The stars in the sky, they're not hundreds of millions of light years away. They're not real luminaries. We're looking into a hollow field. When we magnify any star, what appears? An oscillating field. So when we magnify the planets, what do we see? It all depends. If you're looking through a telescope that, that's not controlled by NASA, you're going to see an oscillating field that's very colorful. If you're looking through a NASA telescope, you're going to see a solid object that was rendered by an artist. But So this is what you're going to see. Now, there's no reason sunlight should ever be seen as a phase on the moon. None, unless we are being deliberately deceived. It's as simple as that. There's no other way to there's no other way to put all the data all the data points together. There's no way. Okay, the moon, we know the moon's not physical because we photograph stars through it. Well, we've seen we've seen some other guys who have filmed the moon and, and we've seen the wave pass through the moon. Now I have a theory, and I haven't discussed that with him, but I've I've discussed it with other people. I have a theory that the lunar wave theory is not isolated to the moon. It's just the easiest way to see it. So Crow 777 documented the lunar wave and I'm on board with it. I have no problem with that at all. But to me, I don't see it as isolated just with the moon. I believe that same wave that he documented, it goes crosses the entire sky and reboots. And this is why we have 
the change of the position of the stars. Do the stars cross the sky in a straight line? Absolutely not. They do it in an arc. Why? That's very deceitful. If we've already determined that the stars are not really luminaries hundreds of millions of light years away and that they're just oscillating fields in a stellosphere, a holographic overlay that mimics a, a, a heavens, but it's not real heavens. If we've already made this assertion, then why do the sky, why do we find them in an arc unless it's the intent of the construct for us to deduce that because there's light reflecting off the moon and the moon is round and we look at the sun and the sun is round and that the stars move at an arc, these are data points that are given to us deceitfully so that we will put together a construct of a solar system and that we will necessarily infer that we are on also a round world that's also a ball or a globe and that and that we are moving through space and that we are spinning this is why this arc of the stars here that's why we have this arc of the stars depending upon where you are if you're at the equator they're straight across the sky if you're 30 degrees north latitude like i am they're they're at 30 degree arc so the, this sky phenomena is very convincing but it falls apart upon scrutiny but for those who want to believe they're in a physical world because they're in a physical avatar, that's all good. The simulacrum is going to reinforce that belief with more phenomena that's going to guarantee that you continue to believe that you're a physical being in a physical world. But for those who have the presence of mind to study the facts and to cogitate, to think them over, and to deduce necessary conclusions based off this data, the world that we live in be begins to fall apart. When that happens, we see with better clarity that it's not as simple as the flat earthers say. It's not as simple as, oh, you're just stuck in a Newtonian paradigm. You're just stuck in that old Freemason model of the sun, of the earth going around the sun. It's more than that. Whoever built the construct wanted us to believe these things. That's why these clues are here. That's 100% why these clues are here. In the flat earth model, the moon must be globular too, or it wouldn't give off those crescent reflections of sunlight unless it was an intent to deceive us. So the more we study the sky, the more we study the heavens, it's not as simple as our perception. It's not as simple as you were just taught to think that you were in a, a solar system. It's not that simple. Because the sky is telling you you are. It's giving you the evidence to deduce these things. But it's not real. It's a stellosphere. The simulacrum is a copy of something that is real. I do believe that there is a system out there. And I believe that we're running simulated, simulated programs to see about our survival about how are we going to survive if our star implodes. It may have never never even happened. The whole 5239 BC nemesis cataclysm might be something that's going to happen in the future. But this is where it gets interesting. Because after documenting all this and showing on my channel over and over and over and over all the historical records, traditions, all the anomalies, all the data points, everything we can show with a calculator, I'm also going to tell you that everything in the historical record never happened. I'm going to tell you, as I document all these things, that we're dealing with a construct and it, it's instructional and it, ha it gives us, it, it provides us information. There's deep things to understand about who we are and where we're going by doing this analysis. But this simulacrum is the nemesis cataclysm simulacrum. And this is what all my study has shown in all these calendars. But the next simulacrum that we volunteer for, it might not be the same people. There might be five or six people in my whole chat thread right now that are going to be in the same simulacrum I'm in next time. Because when this one collapses, I might take my visor off, set it to the side, and I might go, I might go to somewhere else wherever I'm at and go talk to people who are in that simulacrum with me and we'll tell stories like, Oh man, it's awesome. We got to be in, Oh, we got out, but we know people who didn't. We know people who are still stuck in there and we know that they're about to go through another 17 hours of it. 
because they didn't make it out. There's going to be an element of danger involved. I believe that we are volunteering for these experiences and that all the threat of an imploding star, all the threat of all, this is all a part of the program to make it more real. Because I don't believe for a fact that the Oversoul would ever put his own in true danger. And that's the whole point of a simulated world. It allows you to go in and do what you want to do, be who you want to be, and there's no threat of cross-pollination or cross-contamination with the real reality. This is a theory, but it's a theory based off a lifetime of research and nothing else to me makes sense at all. I believe I'm an immortal being, but I believe I am playing through a staged program and it's for my betterment. I am on board with Mandela effect just because it's no different than a sink. It's no different than an edit. It's no different than coincidence or deja vu. I have experienced deja vu. And right now, what I experienced doesn't profoundly affect me. But when I experienced it, I stopped dead in my tracks. And I remembered when I had already done this before. So, I don't have an explanation for that according to the world that has been presented to me. But according to the world that I've come to accept that it's a mathematical construct based on sense perceptions that I perceive jacked in through the central nervous system, I now understand that, damn, I live in a hologram. And because it's a hologram, there are unique times in my life where the geometry of my life will coalesce with the geometry of my life in a totally alternate and different timeline. And every once in a while, when I don't have the necessary things in my current timeline, I'm able to borrow them from my other, other, other Jasons living out other, because in a hologram, there's multiple timelines on everything that's running. And this, this allows for the confluence of events. This allows the simulacrum, the ease by which to, to keep things going in a linear fashion. Because there's multiple versions of all of us always moving around. And sometimes the Jason in this construct just can't get it right. And I need to borrow from one of the Jasons that has gotten it right. And that, and those timelines coalesce, those reality tunnels coalesce. And I don't see any evidence of it other than my day is going bad ass today. Nothing can go wrong. I can purposely walk 100 feet forward and then turn left for two blocks and I'm still going to get to my destination faster. Nothing goes wrong on certain days. That's me borrowing from a whole nother Jason, getting all the thing, all the things that that Jason got. And we all have alternates. And this is where these, this is where programming is. It's multifaceted. I have described many times that I use the frames of reference that we're all comfortable with. And that is simulation. That is computer program. But I have also maintained in many presentations that what we're really experiencing is so technologically advanced that it would look like our modern virtual reality technology. It would pale in comparison. It looks so primitive. What we're actually in is very technologically advanced, but it's still technology. This is why I don't buy into the artificial intelligence. I don't buy into none of that marketing bullshit. Uh, even even Tesla, I mean, even even uh, uh, what's his name, Elon Musk. I just listened to a presentation he did yesterday, and uh, in that presentation he was talking about we don't really have artificial intelligence. We have computer processing that can mimic sentience, and to humans it would appear that they are intelligent. He admitted exactly what I've been saying for two and a half years on this channel that. AI is a marketing gimmick. It does not exist. And the reason it doesn't exist is because you, me, and everybody on this chat thread, and everybody who will listen to this video in the future, and everybody else trapped in this construct right now, we are living inside a vast artificial intelligence apparatus. And as long as we are living inside that AI system, it's a jealous God. It will never allow us to create another AI system within it. Remember, this is the Babel simulation as well. And in the Babel simulation, when we get too technologically advanced, what happens? We get knocked right back down. Call it whatever you want. Lusitania. Call it Titanic. Call it the Hindenburg. 
call, call it the World Trade Center, call it whatever you want. But whenever we build really, really big, we get we get brought right back down. We're humbled every single time. I got a lot of people here that have already heard this story many, many times. So I'm gonna give it to you in 30 less than 30 seconds. I was raised a Southern Baptist. When I was in prison, I wanted to prove that my beliefs were accurate. So I read all the history books I could trying to prove the Bible. Couldn't do it. Found something else instead. And then I found many other things. And I end up writing a book called Chronicon, which documents all my discoveries. Chronicon is huge. It's very detailed packed. I discovered that we are in a simulation. We are trapped by calendars. We are immortal beings. And uh, basically, I did all, all this in prison, but it was a motorcycle accident that put it all into context. A motorcycle, my, a motorcycle accident is what made me understand that all the things I didn't formally understand actually fit a context. And that is, we live in a construct. Before that, I still believe that we lived in an actual solar system. Jacob's Ladder is a Jewish rendition of the Ladder of Set, which is found in the Egyptian Book of Life, which we now call the Egyptian Book of the Dead. It was a ladder that 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 went into the sky, and it was it was basically identified as the pyramid construction. This is a uh, in my book, The Lost Scriptures of Giza, published in 2006. I go into a lot of detail about the ladder symbol in ancient Egypt, the Ladder of Set. And how it was an old symbol for climbing up to the stars. Uh, the when the Jew when when the ancient Hebrews were in in Egypt, they borrowed that old iconography and incorporated it into their own into their own uh, versions of scripture. And it became the ladder of Jacob, but it was never that. This is why in Jacob's dream in his vision, he saw a ladder. And angels were ascending and descending upon it to the earth and all that. But this is the exact same concept we find in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. In the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the ladder of set, spirits go up and down to the star Sirius and all that. It's the same concept, one's, one's just through a Jewish filter. How much of nature is simulated? Well, I believe 100% of your environment is simulated. I believe this I believe this is simulated. Every, every bit of this is simulated. This hard epoxy pyramid is simulated. If I hit myself in the head with it, the pain I felt would be would be would be simulated. This is the beauty of the central nervous system. This is the beauty of this of this major technological bridge between the psyche and simulation. It's hard for people to wrap their minds around the fact that all this is computer programming. It's all simulated. It's very difficult and you can't. You can never ever objectively assert that I'm I'm trapped in a simulation. It's impossible because you're in it. Therefore, Every single piece of information is passed through subjective filters. You'll never be able to do it. I'll never be able to convince somebody who is who is opposed to the idea. I'll never. So I don't even try. I don't care because the archaics data still stands alone. We don't need simulation theory. But without simulation theory, you're going to have a hard time wrapping your mind around some of these data sets, especially concerning calendars and how they work. It doesn't make sense. The arithmetic is way too perfect. The unfolding of historical events have been so mathematically perfect, they have predictive value. And this is never, this would never happen in true chaos. It's only only in programming. And it's only if programming templates were used, as if whole sections of history were inserted with the events all, all there, as if it's all backdrop stage to a, to a reality that we experience and we're convinced that all that backdrop is what really happened in the past when it's not. It's just programming. But I believe that this is a copy. A simulacrum infers the, the existence of something that is real. I do believe that there are other worlds. There's worlds to explore. I believe that. I don't believe the whole creation. I don't believe the oversoul just made a bunch of of a bunch of Taurus fields uh, simulated project projections of of uh, of worlds. No, I believe there's a real cosmos and a real creation out there. And in that real cosmos and real creation, there are simulacrums. There are these these fields that have been set up, like like training centers for immortal beings. Because I've explained many times, we're the the Oversoul never did a creation. That's a religionist vantage point. That's a materialist vantage point. The creation was not an event. The creation is a continuum. And that's the only way we can regard it if we're going to admit that the oversoul, God, is eternal. 
If you have an eternal God, then everything that God does is also unending. If he created or she created anything, then that means they continue to do so. They're eternal. So if that's the case, there will always be need a need of developed immortals to basically go experience more and more and more of the created creation. It never stops. That means there will always be a need for more simulacrums for the develop development of more souls. Who knows? We may have started as a small mammal. We may have moved. In, I'm talking about evolution being absolutely real, but not in the material, in the spiritual. Yeah, evolution could be 100% real, but not biological evolution. It would be it would be immortal evolution. It would be the divine fragmenting into a bunch of sparks. And those sparks start as puppies, cats, mammals, dogs, whatever. And then horses, goats, elephants, dolphins, octopus, the, the, the more intelligent creatures. Next thing you know, they're a human infant. Next thing you know, they keep coming back. A human, 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 human. Now, 70 life sims later, it's time for that simulacrum to collapse or they're going to stay there and they're going to get looped right back through the whole thing again. It's a program. It has a beginning. It has an end. But each simulacrum has a story. Our story is the nemesis cataclysm. I don't know what the next simulacrum is going to be. The next simulacrum might be a totally different background. All the back history may be different. And when we're injected into the story and we begin our life sims, could be something so different than this world here. So different. We can't restrict it. You have to understand if imagination, empathy, and intuition are, are the core aspects of an immortal being, imagine those on the level of the creatrix or the creator. Imagine it because they would never stop creating more and more worlds, doing all kinds of things, building for us things that we will enjoy and experience. And it's a feedback loop. The creator then enjoys the creation because the created enjoys it. It's, a, it's an eternal feedback loop. But it's got to start somewhere for, for new immortals. And that's who we are. Yeah. And who knows? Each simulacrum may have one benefactor that's allowed to come back in and make sure that your trajectory of events are going the way they're supposed to. You know, in 544 BC, they could have called him Buddha. I mean, before that, in 2318 BC, they could have called him Vohi. We don't know. But I know in 3439 BC, we called him Enki. In 15 centuries later, when the Jews stole a bunch of histories out of Babylon and wrote their own versions and included themselves where they had never belonged in the historical narratives, they called him Enoch. But it was the same personality. And 2,000 years ago, the same benefactor in the programming appeared, and his name was Jesus. And then later on, he took on other identities. He was Apollonius of Tyana. We have, we have evidence of the inclusion of the benefactor's appearance over and over and over in different time periods, but he seems to be timeless and not appearing in a linear fashion. I don't believe it was a physical manifestation. Remember, guys, I'm very, very adamant that you understand that every calendar that we have ever studied and all the historical texts from the ancient world were all what? They were all drafted, composed in retrospect, not when they occurred. This is great evidence of artificiality. 100% evidence of artificiality, meaning history is a construct, just like the world we're in right now is a construct. The incident was 1411 BC. If any of you are, are familiar with my Phoenix phenomenon, 1411 BC fits on the 138 year timeline. It was that, that in the biblical chronology, you can verify this, excuse me, in the biblical chronology, 40 years after the Exodus, and we know from many different historical texts, 1447 BC, Jewish chronologers, Emmanuel Velikovsky, 
Even the U.S. cryptologist R.A. Boule, who did a mathematical analysis of the Old Testament, he confirms 1447 B.C. Uh, 1447 B.C. is in is in Teal's chronology uh, in uh, the sacred numbers of the Hebrew kings. Uh, 1447 B.C. is the date of the Exodus, according to biblical chronologist Stephen Jones. And there's many more other sources. I think Rashi as well. Uh, Moses Maimonides, 1447 BC was 792 years after the Great Flood. It was 500 years after the birth of Abraham. Uh, 1447 BC was the Exodus event, and according to the biblical narrative, 800—I mean, 40 years—the Israelites were in wandering before they began the conquest of Canaan. Conquest of Canaan was a four-year episode, and while well, they were attacking all the Canaanite cities. 1411 BC fits perfectly for what's described in the Old Testament as Joshua commanding the sun to stand still and then stones rained from the sky on the on the Canaanite armies and, and decimated them allowing the Israelites to overcome uh, militaries that were that were superior to their own. This was a Phoenix phenomenon episode 1411 BC the sun the sun standing still. I believe, I believe absolutely you have free will. I know I can walk into the street right now, and because it's a street, I understand your argument, the illusion of choice. The street goes this way, and the street goes that way, but I can walk outside right now, and I don't have to go either way. I can go across the street into the neighbor's yard, jump his fence, go back and, and hit, a, hit a totally different street. Listen, the illusion of choice is a very real phenomenon for the collective. Remember, fundamental teaching of archaics you live in two different realities in the personal you're absolutely free to do whatever you want be whatever you want and suffer whatever you want to suffer or enjoy what you want to suffer it all depends on what you project in the personal there is there is no enslavement in the collective what you're saying is absolutely real. There is an illusion of choice. You are always giving two or three variables, but they're always a part of the construct. 